thank you very much for this opportunity and it's a privilege to read with you the gospel of john i thank uh, dr mathi koshi the director of the ecological department for this initiative it's a great initiative to study the ecological lessons from the bible and that to so systematically over the period of time i i really thank dr matthew koshi for this initiative and this cooperation with the united theological college the topic assigned to me is ecological reading of the gospel of john normally the gospel of john is considered a spiritual gospel our own appa sami wrote a very illuminating book on the gospel of john in the early 20th century john as bhakti marga people try to read this beautiful gospel a unique gospel a gospel with very simple language in greek but with very profound meaning people try to read it as a gospel that will help us to strengthen get strengthened in our spiritual journey but this gospel also read from the dualistic perspective you see a lot of dualistic interpretations you see the contrast between light and darkness contrast between life and death contrast between truth and falsehood and this gospel speaks about from above and from below the gospel also speaks about world foreignness jesus comes from the father and goes back to the father kesman wrote a book informing us that uh, jesus is god walking on the earth this world foreignness as a negative understanding of the earth the world as such we are the people of the other world we move towards another sphere so we don't normally do not take the present sphere seriously though the world foreignness concept does not speak in such terms when you read books on this subject on the world foreignness of jesus in the fourth gospel you tend to think in that in those terms and this gospel is very much anthropocentric only those who believe in the one who has come have the authority to become the children of god it is about human response to god's salvific act it does not contain the aspect of the earth the cosmos the the whole created order or the biodiversity in which we live in the three articles which were suggested for this topic which has been circulated to all of you asks this question is earth valued in john 
is earth valued in job i would like to answer this question during the course of this study today john writes about cosmos he uses it many times in his gospel there are nuances in the meaning of word cosmos cosmos is the place into which light comes and dwells and this cosmos includes the earth the arena in which the drama of salvation is played out this is what you understand when we read the first chapter of john the second nuance is that the cosmos is the totality of creation it includes the heaven and the earth and thereby implies the interconnectedness interdependence and interrelationality of all the created order the living and the non living everything that has been created there is a third nuance that the word cosmos as the world of human affairs especially in relation to sin it is a world which is subjected to justice judgment crisis crisis judgment and belief if you read uh, the paraclete passages you you understand this nuance of the word cosmos but usually we say that cosmos in john is primarily a cosmos that is rebelled against god that is in opposition to god that is in defiance against god and this cosmos is contrasted with the world above this is normally the understanding of the cosmos when we read john 3:16 for god so loved the world cosmos which is rebelled against god that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life indeed god did not send the son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him if, if we paraphrase it god sent the son into the world the purpose of sending the son was not to condemn the world the purpose was that the world might be saved through him here the world that is rebelled against god becomes the arena of drama of salvation it is for the restoration of the cosmic order the interconnectedness interrelation and interdependence of the cosmic order but in john 16 jesus speaks about overcoming the world overcoming the cosmos not condemning but overcoming but take courage i have conquered 
the world. If you read the same, uh, th that verse with the background of John 15, 18, if the world hates you, be aware that it hated me before it hated you. If you belong to the world, the world would love you as its own. Because you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore world hates you. See, here, Jesus speaks about the forces that negate the created goodness. When the goodness is negated, that is sin. And John 15, 16 chapters speak about the paraclete bringing the understanding of this sin, judgment, and belief. When you have the paraclete, you will have the understanding. Sin, judgment, In John 17, 21, there is a hint that John includes not only those of that age, but of the coming age, also in the perspective. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who believe who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. This concept of oneness is not just a spiritual oneness of the creator and the created. It is about understanding that interconnectedness, interrelatedness and dependence, interdependence. And it teaches us about the necessity of human community and the mutuality of earth and the whole creation. Yes? At this level, you can say, if we start analyzing the nuances of the word cosmos, John has different levels of understanding cosmos, and John also emphasizes the interconnectedness, interrelatedness, and interdependence. In that way, we can read John ecologically. But there are creation images in the gospel. You can also read the whole gospel from the perspective of creation images. You have water. Water is a powerful symbol throughout the gospel. You have water of recognition. The baptism, baptismal water. You already meet this baptismal water in chapter one. Water of renewal. Chapter 3, water of joy, chapter 2, water becoming wine, water of life, chapter 4, the Samaritan woman, and if you come to chapter 5, water of healing. And also, if we move to chapter 9, you have water of healing. 
You have another creation image, light, which is a symbol for illumination, openness, making everything transparent. It is also resistance to darkness. It also speaks about overcoming darkness. You have the imagery of wind, wind as ruach, the breath of life. Chapter three, unless you are born of water and spirit, the ruach. And the same chapter speaks about the mysterious way the wind blowing, mysterious, unpredictable ways of wind blowing. We will not understand, we will not comprehend, but the wind blows. And then you have John 20, 22. You have the uh, Johannine Pentecost already. When he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. This understanding of Johannine Pentecost is about restoring relationships, restoring interconnectedness, restoring interdependence. You can also read the gospel through the creational images. Another level of ecological reading of the gospel is possible. But to find out if John's gospel speaks about the value of earth, you have to read the prologue of John. The Logos, the Logos hymn. <clears throat> John does not begin his gospel like the other gospels. No genealogy, no birth narratives. There is no reference to the Old Testament, especially Isaiah and John the Baptist speaking the the prophecy of Isaiah once again. Instead, John's gospel begins with a connection to the creation stories of the Old Testament, of Genesis. In the beginning, there is a reminder of the creation story in the beginning. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Then the creation comes into picture. All things came into being through him and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being Logos him at the very beginning brings creator and creation together. Logos, the Greek principle behind creation. Logos bridges the gulf between God and the creation. But if we Read the Logos hymn from the perspective of the wisdom tradition of the Old Testament. Sophia. Sophia, the architect of creation. It gives another 
whole set of meaning to us. If you read uh, the Logos hymn from the perspective of Proverbs 8, 26 to 31, when he had not yet made earth and fields or the world's first bit, bits of soil, when he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit, so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him, like a master worker, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhibited world and delighting in human ways. There is very beautiful connection where the wisdom, the logos, as the architect of the all things came into being through him. Without him, not one thing came into being what has come into being. Logos has relation to God and creation within human community and within creation. If you read the first few verse, word, verses of John prologue. If you read relation instead of logos, there will be a new meaning to the logos hymn. In the beginning was the relation. And the relation was with God. And the relation was God. God's relationship is explained, exegeted, and interpreted through Logos. And here, in the third and the fourth word, verse, John connects the creation story once again. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. For him, the creation is good. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome. When God created the world, he saw his creation good. And the light, while shining in the darkness, and darkness not able to overcome it or comprehend it, is a sign, is the Hunayn interpretation of telling that creation is good. And it reaches its climax in John 1, 14. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. We see a deep incarnation. Word, logos, Sophia, becoming flesh. The eternal becoming mortal. The immortal entering into time and space and becoming part of the history. Many times we 
equate or interpret incarnation through Pauline eyes, through canonics, to Philippians, the, the, the hymn you read in Philippians 2. Is it self-emptying? It is just kenosis that is interpreted and reformulated here. Sometimes we speak about solidarity, but this is not just solidarity of empathy or sympathy. But this incarnation is about partake and becoming. Word becoming flesh, eternal and immortal, entering into time and space and becoming mortal. There is no docetism here. It's not just looking like it is becoming like. And the force and the punchline is about the word becoming flesh and pe pe pitching its tent among us, lived among us. If you translate it from the Greek, it should be pitching tent among us. Tent is a symbol of travel. Tent and travel go together. And this travel together is connected to the earth. And this travel is an exploration of the glory of God. This travel is an exploration of exploration to understand grace and truth. Therefore, I call it a deep incarnation. Logos him speaks about earth and it ascribes what to the creation. To the earth. It is not just a transitory. It is something which is to, into which God himself has pitched his tent. It is also important to note, it is not just the Logos hymn which speaks about creation and incarnation gives us an ecological perspective. The whole perspective of passion and resurrection in, in John's gospel is very much ecological. It is explained through an agrarian parable. Chapter 12, 12 verse 24. Verily, very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. John has already explained his theology of passion and resurrection here. And this is the verse which will give you a perspective into the passion and resurrection narratives of John. And this is the verse which will give you the key to understand why John collected and collated his special material of passion narratives and resurrection narratives. This very selection speaks about 
this parable. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth it, and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. You cannot see the power of a seed. It is invisible. It manifests only when it gets in contact with the earth. When it is sowed, when it goes under the ground, beneath the ground, its potential, its inner strength and capability manifests. And that too, the power of the seed is manifested through its breaking and sprouting. It is manifested through death and resurrection, sprouting. The seed dies. A new community of seeds manifests. The harvest. And that enables resurrection of the community. Therefore, if we read chapter 18 to 20 from this perspective, you understand Johannine collection of passion narratives and resurrection narratives in a far better way. In chapter 18 and 19 in the passion narratives, Jesus is very confident. He is in control, even in the face of grave adversity. Very courageous, self-composed, and he has control over the situation. John has noted this already in the 10th chapter. Because Jesus says that I will give my life. No one will take it away from him. But he himself will give it. Life is not crushed. Life is not taken away but given. In order that new life sprouts. If you read chapter 18 beginning when the chief priests and the scribes come to take hold of Jesus. Jesus speaks to them whom you are searching for. Whom you are looking for. I am Jesus. They fall to the ground. That is a symbolic assertion that it is Jesus who is in control and Jesus who is giving his life. And it ends in John 19.34 and Johannine selection of the words of Jesus on the cross is also illuminated. And John 19, 34, the climax of Jesus' death. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once blood and water came out. Most of the time we read it sac sacramentally. We say both sacraments uh, Baptism and uh, Holy Communion have its origin on the cross. But look at the way uh, John wants us to understand. At the moment of death, you witness elixir of life flowing. You have blood. At the moment of death, you witness Elixir of life, water flowing. 
the resurrection is not yet come but the life continues to flow at the cross john 20 is about the new community around the resurrected one all these narratives you see a resurrected community around the resurrected one Logos, as well as the passion and resurrection narratives, inform us the interconnectedness and the interdependence and the way we can interpret and read the Johannine passages from the ecological perspective. If we go back to the chapter th three of John, it speaks about new birth, born of water and spirit. And the Conversation goes on to chapter 316. It is about God giving his son. This giving is a keyword for John. It is an interpretive key to the whole gospel. Father gives, Father shows everything, if you go to chapter 5, Father tells everything, therefore the Son will do greater things. And when you come to chapter 10, as the Father gives, gives himself, the son gives himself. And then John 10, 30 comes. I and my father are one. They are one in this act of giving. And this giving is key to the Johannine community. Those who want to follow Jesus have to give, have to mirror the giving of God, giving of Jesus, to give yourself. And in that giving, the from above, chapter 3, unless you are born water and spirit, anothen is the Greek word, you mirror the from above here below and now. It is not dualistic. You mirror what God is, himself is in your life. You represent the giving God. You relive the giving Jesus. You therefore remember in your life, you reactualize in your life the from above, here and now, here below. And that is the experience of life eternal. There is no ending for this. this. This is not just now, but it is eternal. You continue to be of the above. 
here on earth and therefore you understand and experience life itself whole understanding of giving is about restoration of intrinsic relationship life is about interconnectedness interdependence and intrinsic relationship when we understand that when we have that knowledge you have eternal life you have you have salvation and for john holy spirit gives this discernment and as an advocate he will make you understand the sin make you understand the judgment and make you understand the belief and lead you to all therefore we all need that healing and liberation john 9 is a beautiful narrative of it john uses water and he dust the mud to heal a man born blind but when he is healed he is cast out when his interdependence and interconnectedness is manifested when the man born blind sees light when it becomes transparent he has he is cast out from the garden but then the true liberation awaits jesus comes to him and embraces him and admits him to his flock that is why in the johannine gospel church the called out community is a resurrected community i want you to remember this resurrection in terms of the agrarian parable of seed and the resurrected community is not an organization not an institution for john there are two allegories which will explain what ecclesia is in john but this ecclesia this resurrected community is an organism for him it's a living organism chapter 10 is about the flock a community which is networked connected to each other connected with the earth community you no know, the flock the sheep and the shepherd they move from pasture to pasture water to water they pass through the dangers but then the listening the voice not only of the shepherd but of the community and the the dangers is very very important but the shepherd the head leads the flock towards life life eternal john 15 we all know that the allegory of wine and the branches again the community is 
an organ organism not an organization not an institution the vine and the branches work together therefore the consummation the sum total of the work of the whole vine is the fruit it is not the branches it is not the vine that bears fruit it is the sum total of the whole vine interdependency interconnectedness is once again emphasized interdependency interconnectedness with the earth community is also emphasized it's not only about the resurrection community which is an organism the very discipleship in john is very ecologically molded interconnectedness interdependence and interrelatedness is emphasized come and see is the call for disciples john 139 you are invited to a new relationship you are invited to a interdependent relationship and interconnected relationship come and see it is again elaborated when the call is come and give you know chapter 6 when jesus feeds 5000 that uh, boy gives what he had when you come and give that is disciples for for john you make the whole community understand what life is all about to come and see come and see the renewal come and see the rebuilding because chapter 1 when the call is about come and see then the water of joy comes in you know wine water becoming wine and jesus cleansing the temple and speaking about destroy this temple i will build it in 3 days renewal rebuilding and chapter 3 it's about re- renewal uh, of rebirth this is about restoration of life come and see come and give it is participation it is not just come coming it is about participation giving as i said earlier give is the key word which will open many new interpretations to john it's not about authority it is not about hierarchy it is not about having power it is about giving in giving you have that interconnected interrelated interdependent network of life and we already saw john 15 come and remain is also a call for this disciples remain in order to bear fruit but remembering that it is not we 
who bear fruit. It is the community bears fruit together. It is the whole organism bearing fruit together. That interdependency and interconnectedness is essential for fruit bearing. And the key for discipleship is to die like a seed and reserve. To die in order to re resurrect as a community. And the final aspect of discipleship in John is also in chapter 21 when John speaks about Jesus inviting the, the, the disciples to come and eat, to be part of the sharing community. So the answer to the question which I raised in the beginning, does earth has value in John? Yes, it has the worth, not only in the Logos hymnal, but in exploring and exegeting the whole gospel, you have the theme of interconnectedness, interdependence, coming again and again. And in that, we have a beautiful exegesis of Japanine gospel from the theological perspective. Thank you for your patience here.